begins now. A writer burns his book because he knows it can never be published. Satan visits Moscow with an entourage of demons, and they both tell the same strange story of Pontius Pilate and the crucifixion, a story that differs radically from the Gospels. Thus, the bare bones, as it were, of the Master and Margarita, a novel by Mikhail Bulgakov, Stalin's favorite writer, the greatest writer to emerge in Russia since the revolution, so they said, once upon a time. The times change. Dictators grow fickle. Writers lose favor. Bulgakov knew it could never be published, not in his lifetime and certainly not in Stalin's. They thought he'd burnt it, and he had. But his wife kept a copy. It remained hidden for 25 years after his death, 10 after Stalin's. This is the story of Pontius Pilate and the trial in Jerusalem of a certain vagrant. day of the spring month of Nisan, in a white cloak lined with blood red, the prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, emerged into a colonnade connecting the two wings of the palace of Herod the Great. Jerusalem, the city of the Jews, and the Greeks, and Persians, and Cappadocians, and the Numidians, and the assorted riffraff of the empire. This lunatic palace of Herod's. My head. What about this prisoner from Galilee? Has the report been sent to the Tetrarch? Yes, Hegeman. What does he say? From Herod Antipas, Tetrach of Galilee, to His Excellency Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea, for His Imperial Highness Tiberius Caesar, greetings. Yes, yes. Yeah. Summary will do. You've obviously read it. He refuses to make a decision on the matter. He respects the authority of the Sanhedrin as custodians of Jewish law and refers the death sentence to you as the representative of Roman authority to confirm or deny. Oh, let's have him in. Incite the people to destroy the temple of Jerusalem. Good man. Believe me. You call me good man. You're mistaken. In Jerusalem, everyone calls me a savage beast. That is entirely correct. Centurion. The 
criminal calls me good man. Take him away for a moment to explain to him how he should address me. Don't cripple him. Prefect Hegemon. No other form of address is to be used. Stand up straight. Do you understand, or shall I hit you again? I understand. Don't beat me. Where are you from? From the town of Gamala. Where do you live now? I, I have no home. I travel from town to town. You are, in short, a tramp. Can you read and write? Yes. Do you know any language beside Aramaic? Yes. Greek. So you're not as stupid as you look, then. Yet you want to destroy the temple. You incite people to burn it down. Good. Hegemon, never in my life have I wanted to destroy the temple, nor tried to incite other people to do so. It would be an act of utter futility, totally senseless. All sorts of people swarm into this city for the festival. Magicians, astrologers, soothsayers, assassins, and liars. You, for instance, you are a liar. There are witnesses. You were heard. These good people, Hegemon, they are not educated. They misunderstand what I say. I'm beginning to think this confusion is going to last for a very long time. And all because he writes it down untruthfully. Every word I say. What's been written down here? A little enough is enough to hang you. No, 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 Hegemon, I don't mean that. I mean, there's this man who follows me around the whole time, writing down everything I say on a goatskin parchment. One day I looked at what he had written and I was horrified. I pleaded with him, stop writing this nonsense, burn it. But he tore it out of my hands and ran off. Who was this? Matthew. Matthew the Levite. I first met him on the road to Bethany. You know where there's a fig garden on the corner? He was a tax collector. I spoke to him, but he just started abusing me. That is, he thought he was abusing me by calling me a dog. <laughs> well, personally, I find nothing in a dog to make such a comparison offensive. Anyhow, when he had listened to me for a while, he calmed down and finally threw all his money into the road and said that he would follow me. This country, unreal. He said that money had become hateful to him. Since then, he has been my companion. Two words. That's all it needs. Hang him. That's all I have to say. And I can dismiss the guard and lie down in a darkened room and call Vanguard to me. And that would be an end of it. I could even take poison. What did you say about the temple? to the crowd in the bazaar. I said, Hegemon, that the temple of the old faith would fall and that a new temple of truth would rise in its place. I put it like that to make my meaning clear. What's a tramp like you know about the truth? What is truth? The truth, in this instance, is that your head aches. It aches so badly you are having cowardly thoughts of death. You not only do not have the strength to talk to me, but it hurts you to even look at me. 
I have involuntarily become your torturer. And this grieves me. You can't even think. You only want your dog, who is apparently the only creature for whom you feel any affection. But your agony will soon be over. And your head will clear. Well, there you are. It's over. I'm glad. I'd advise you to leave the palace for a while, take a walk somewhere, not too far, in the gardens perhaps, or on the Mount of Olives. There's a storm on the way, but not till later, towards the evening. A stroll will do you the world of good. I'd be happy to accompany you. I've had some thoughts which you might find interesting. I'd like to talk them over with you, particularly as you strike me as a man of great intelligence. The trouble is, you're too locked in on yourself. You've completely lost faith in people. After all, you must agree, you can't give all your love to a dog. Your life is a poor one, Hegeman. Untie his hands. Tell me truthfully, are you a physician? No, Hegeman. I'm no physician. How did you know I wanted to call my dog? It's very simple, really. You moved your hand in the air. As if to stroke something. And your lips pursed. ask you. Do you by any chance know Latin? Yes, I do. And you say you're not a physician? Believe me, I'm not. Oh. If you want to keep it to yourself, it's up to you. It says here, you came into Jerusalem through the Sushan Gate on a donkey surrounded by a mob who hailed you as if you were a prophet. Is that true? I don't have a donkey, Hegeman. I certainly came by the Shushan Gate, but on foot. And the only person with me was Matthew, the Levite. No, no one shouted anything at me. No one in Jerusalem knew me. No one. Do you not know these men? Hestas, Dismas, and Barabbas? These good men I do not know. Is that the truth? That is the truth. You swear it. What shall I swear by? Your life, if you like. It's hanging by a thread. No thread of your making, Hegeman. No. But I can cut it. Are these the only witnesses against this man? Uh, yes, Hegeman, but they're... Dismas, Hestas, and Barabbas. Convicted thieves, rebels, murderers, and in all probability, perjurers. So, my philosopher, are these all good men? Yes. And the prison guards who did that to you? Yes, Hegeman. There are no evil people in the world. That's the first I've heard of it. Perhaps I know too little of life. Is this out of some Greek book you've read? No, it's a conclusion I've come to myself. And this is what you preach? Yes. Take off your helmet.
the centurion here, is he a good man? Yes. He's a sad man, though. Since these good men disfigured him, he's become brutal and callous. I'd be interested to know who did that to him. And I'll tell you, with pleasure, I was there at the Battle of Edistaviso in the Valley of the Virgins. I was a tribune of the Legion fighting under the command of Tiberius. He was a soldier then like the rest of us. These good men were Germans who fell on the centurion here like dogs on a bear. If I hadn't cut my way through to him with the cavalry, you, my philosopher, would not have had your conversation with him a few moments ago. If I could speak to him now, I'm certain that he would change completely. I think the legate of the Legion would not be very pleased if you were to take it into your head to talk to any of his soldiers. Nor would I. You've too clever a tongue on you. It's all ridiculous, of course. What are they up to? Hegemon. The Jews, the priests, the Sanhedrin. This is some intrigue of theirs, isn't it? One of their labyrinths. Uh, possibly, Hegemon. Yes, but... it's some religious thing. They want to impose their authority over the dissidents. And they want us to back them. Well, I'm not going to be drawn into it. There's no evidence for the charge against this man. The witnesses are all criminals themselves. He's clearly insane quite harmless. I'm going to refuse to confirm the death sentence imposed by the Sanhedrin, but because this man's preaching might cause unrest. I will exile him from Jerusalem, confine him at my own expense at my residence in Caesarea. He can work in the library, catalogue the books. So take this down. Unfortunately, Hegeman, there is another charge. said anything about the great Caesar. Answer me truthfully and with care. Have you or have you not? Telling the truth is not a matter for care. It is pleasant and easy. I don't care whether it's pleasant for you or not. Just speak it. And when you speak it, weigh every word as if it's a matter of life or death. A very agonizing death. Do you know a man called Judas of Cariath? Have you ever spoken with such a man? And if so, what exactly did you say to him about the power of Caesar? It was like this. The day before yesterday, in the evening, I met a young man in the street near the temple. He introduced himself as Judas from the town of Karioth. He'd heard me speaking, and he wanted me to come to his house for supper. Is he a good man? He is a very good man, very curious very interested in my ideas. He welcomed me to his house. He... He lit the lamps. Why, yes. He asked me to explain my views on the power of the state. He was particularly interested in this question. And what did you say to him? Or perhaps you've forgotten. Oh, no. I remember it very well. I said, among other things, that any kind of power is a form of violence against the people, and that the time will come when there will be no earthly power, either of the Caesars or of any other kind. The state, as we know it, will wither away, and men will enter a condition of truth and justice, where there will be no need for any kind of power. Go on. Well, that was it, really. Then some people rushed in and tied me up and carted me off to prison. There is 
There never has been, there never will be a greater, more glorious rule than that of the Emperor Tiberius. What business have you, a, a trap, a filthy vagabond, a criminal lunatic, to talk about the power of Caesar? Dismiss the guards! Leave me alone with the prisoner. A matter of state security. I see that some misfortune has come from my speaking to this young man of Carioth. I have a foreboding, Hegemon, that something unpleasant is going to happen to him. I think there's someone else for whom you should feel foreboding, and whose fate is likely to be far worse than for this Judas of Carioth. Yeshua Hanatsri, do you believe in any kind of gods? There is only one God. I believe in him and pray to him. Pray for all your worth. But it won't help. This city, this detestable place. Do you have a wife? Family? No, Hegeman. I am alone. It would have been better if they'd killed you before you ever met Judas of Carioth. You should release me, Hegemon. I see that they do mean to kill me. Do you honestly imagine, you wretched cretin, that a Roman prefect can release a man who said what you've said? Or do you think I'm willing to take your place? I don't share your insane ideas. And listen to me. If from this moment on you say one more word to anyone at all... Hegemon. Not another word. God! Take this down. In the name of the Imperial Caesar, I, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea, confirm the death sentence passed by the Assembly of the Sanhedrin on the criminal Yeshua Hanatsri. Take him away. Where's the lightning cohort? They've been sent to cordon off the palace, Hegemon. There's a large crowd gathering in the square below. Right. Detailed two centuries. One to leave immediately to cordon off the place of execution, the other to escort the prisoners there. But keep Panotsri apart from the other prisoners. Don't let him talk to anyone. And forbid the guards to talk to him on pain of severe punishment. Yes, Prefect. Oh, and uh, send the legate of the Legion to me. Send a message to Joseph Caiaphas, president of the Sanhedrin. Tell him, tell him I'd like to talk to him up here, in private. Come to hear you pronounce the sentence. What is it to be? I've confirmed the death sentence on Hestas, Dismas, Barabbas, and now this other, Anotsri. However, in accordance with your own laws and in honor of the feast of the Passover, one of these prisoners must be released. The first to try to incite the people to rebel against Caesar and they killed a Roman soldier. Obviously, they must die. So it has to be one of the other two, Barabbas or Hanotsri. Which of these two does the Sanhedrin wish to release? The Sanhedrin requests the release of Barabbas. I must confess, your answer surprises me. There must be a misunderstanding. Hanotsri is obviously a madman. He's guilty of making ridiculous speeches and disturbing the peace. But Barabbas not only made a direct call to rebellion, but he killed one of your guards when he was arrested. Now, there's no comparison between the two offenses. 
I must ask you to reconsider your decision and release the least dangerous of these two. Hanotsri is gravely offended against the law of the Jews. In the circumstances, we must request the release of Barabbas. But even after what I've just said, a petition from the direct representative of Imperial Rome. I priest, I must ask you again. And again, I must tell you, the Sanhedrin requests the release of Bar Abbas. I'm suffocating. Yes, it's stifling. It's a storm brewing. It's been a terrible spring this year. It's stifling to breathe the same air as you, Caiaphas. Take care, High Priest. What? What are you saying, Pilate? Are you threatening me for insisting on the same sentence that you yourself have confirmed? We are used to our Roman prefects choosing their words with more care. I... I hope no one's listening. Who could overhear us here? I'm not the simple young tramp you condemned to death. I'm not an innocent child. I know what I'm saying and where I'm saying it. This is my own military headquarters. I'm surrounded by troops. Not even a mouse could squeeze through. Not even that rat. What's his name? Judas. You know who I mean, don't you, Caiaphas? If he ever gets in here, he'll live to regret it. I think you understand me, don't you? Well, understand this. There's going to be no peace for you from now on. Not for you, nor for your people. That I swear to you. We know you hate us, Pilot. The Jewish people know. You've made us suffer enough already, and I can believe you'll make us suffer more, but you'll never destroy us. God will protect us. And Caesar, too. Caesar will hear our petition. Caesar, the all-powerful, will defend us from Pilate, the destroyer. Oh, no. You've complained of me to Caesar once too often. Now it's my turn. He's going to hear how you protect the lives of known rebels. How you force me to take down the shields with the Roman insignia from the city streets. How you force me to move troops here. Force me to come here myself to keep an eye on you. Then you won't just see one cohort in Jerusalem. The entire Fulminata Legion will be at the city walls. And Arab cavalry with them. Then you'll hear a bitter weeping and wailing. Then you'll remember that you saved Barabbas and sent a peaceful philosopher to his death. Do you seriously believe this peaceful philosopher? No, you don't. This demagogue won't bring peace to Jerusalem and you know it. You want him released so he can carry on blaspheming against the law of Moses, stirring up the masses against their spiritual leaders, ridiculing the faith. But I am the high priest of the Jews. While I live, I will never let the truth be profaned. I will defend my people. Do you hear me, Pilate? Take heed. This man denied the supremacy of your Caesar. Will you mention that in your report? Because if you don't, then I'll make sure he hears it. discussion. We must proceed with the business. If you'll excuse me, I have a matter to attend to. incitement to rebellion have been sentenced to the shameful death of crucifixion. The sentence will be carried out on the hill of Golgotha. Here they are before you. 
but in accordance with law and custom, in honor of the feast of the Passover, the almighty Caesar will return the life of one of these miserable creatures. The name of the man who will be released is Barabbas. Caesar. Mmm. A superb wine, Prefect. It's not Falerno by any chance. Cucuba, 30 years old. So, tell me, what's the mood of the city? I believe, Prefect, that the mood of Jerusalem can now be described as satisfactory. We can be sure there'll be no more disturbances. The only thing we can be sure of is the might of the great Caesar. God send him long life and happiness. Universal peace. So you think uh, we can send the troops away now? I think one cohort could leave. It might be useful if they paraded through the city on their way. Oh, excellent. I'll send them off the day after tomorrow. When this festival is over, I'll go with them myself. I only wish it could be today. Does the prefect not find Jerusalem to his liking? the most desperate place on earth. At any moment, I feel I'm going to be forced to witness some revolting and gratuitous act of violence. I'm forever shuffling troops around, reading denunciations, half of them directed at me. They're all fanatics. And these endless feast days. Mm. Festivals are a little difficult here. Well, I tell you, this one can't end soon enough for me. So, tell me about the execution. What is the precise nature of the prefect's interest? Well, was there uh, any attempt on the part of the mob to interfere? No, nothing like that. And you yourself made sure they were dead? The prefect can rest easy on that score. He even thanked us for killing him. Who? Who did? I'm sorry, prefect. Did I not say? I'm not sorry. What exactly did he say? He said he thanks those who took his life, and he doesn't blame them. What did he mean? He didn't say. He didn't try to preach to the soul. He didn't have much to say on this occasion. Only one thing. He said that he considered cowardice to be one of the worst of the mortal sins. 
what was he talking about? I don't know. Nobody knew. He was always a little strange. What do you mean? In a way, he was always looking at people, staring at them with that puzzled smile on his face. And there was nothing else? Nothing. I want you to remove all three bodies, bury them in secret, so that nothing of them remains. Oh, uh, just a moment, sit down. There are one or two other matters. Now, the first is, uh, your work as head of the Secret Service here in Jerusalem has been exemplary. I shall mention it in my next dispatch to Rome. I merely do my duty in the Imperial Service. Yeah, but what I wanted to say was this. If uh, you are given the opportunity to move from here with a promotion that you refuse it and stay here with me, I'd hate to give you up. I'll find some alternative means of rewarding you. I am happy to serve under the Prefect's command. Good. Good. Now, the other matter. It concerns this Judas of Carrioth. They say he would have been paid for the warm welcome he gave the mad philosopher at his home. He will be paid. Mm. And will it be a large sum? That is something no one knows, Hegemon. But I know he will get the money this evening. They've summoned him to the high priest's house. The fact is, I've had information that he's going to be murdered tonight. I've had no such information. Can I take the liberty of asking where it came from? Ah. Permit me to keep that to myself for the time being. It came to me by chance from an obscure and perhaps unreliable source. But I have to allow for every eventuality. Most of all, I must trust my instinct in these matters. It's never let me down yet. The information I have is that one of the secret followers of Hanasri outraged by the treachery of this Judas, will arrange to have him assassinated tonight. The reward he was paid for the betrayal will then be thrown into the palace of the high priest with a note saying, take back your accursed money. Would you say the high priest will be pleased to receive such a message and on Passover night? Not only will he not be pleased, I suspect it will stir up a major scandal. That's exactly my opinion. And that's why I must ask you to take any step necessary to ensure the safety of this man. The command of the prefect will be executed. That's a good omen. There's a saying in Greek. 
The man who goes unrecognized may soon go rich. Where are you going? Why do you want to know? But we agreed. I was to come to your house this evening. You said you'd be there all evening. I got bored. It's a holiday. What am I supposed to do? Sit on the veranda listening to you whining on about how you love me. And the old woman taking in every word so she can repeat it to my husband. No, I decided to get out of the city and listen to the nightingales. Out of the city? What, now? On your own? Of course, on my own. Okay, can I come with you? Nietzsche? Why won't you answer me? Won't I be bored with you? <laughs> All right. But we can't be seen walking together. You'll have to meet me then. Where? You know the olive grove in Gethsemane? Over the Ketchup. Uh, yes, yes, I know it. You go past the olive press. There's a small grotto. I'll be there. Only don't come straight away. Have a little patience.
I would ruin my career for a man who's committed a crime against Caesar? I would. I would now. Not this morning, maybe. Believe me, I'd go to any lengths. Calm yourself. It's all right. Now we're together. We'll be together always. Where one of us goes, the other will follow. When people remember me, they will remember you in the same breath. Hmm. You won't forget me. Still, Bangor. Still. Even at night, there's no rest. You have a vile job too, Marcus. You have to maim people. Oh, don't take offense. I do worse things. Believe me. What is it? The head of the Secret Service is here. that you have me court-martialed and dismissed from the service. Here is the bag of money which the killers threw into the palace of the high priest. The blood is that of Judas of Carioth. Where's the body? I don't know. We'll begin a search in the morning. But you're sure he's been killed? Prefect, I have worked in Judea for 15 years. I don't need to see a corpse to know when a man is dead. Oh, I'm sorry, Afranius. I haven't woken up properly. How much is in there? Thirty tetradrachmas. <laughs> Not much. So, what now? I'll order an immediate investigation. But as I said, I submit myself for court-martial. On what charge? Incompetence. My men followed him to the high priest's palace, but when he left, they lost him in the bazaar. I can't understand how. I've never known it happened before. I don't think a court-martial will be necessary. Call the agents who lost him to account. But I don't want their reprimand to be a harsh one. We did all we could to take care of this scoundrel. How was he killed? With great artistry. Hmm. How did they manage to get that back to Caiaphas, these uh, assassins? Oh, it's not especially difficult. His house is on the street. They threw it over a wall into the courtyard. With the writing on it? Just as you feared. Oh, I can imagine the uproar that must have caused. Yes, there was quite a commotion. They sent for me immediately. I asked if they'd been paying money to anyone, but they denied it categorically. Well, if they didn't pay anyone, they didn't pay anyone. It would be an even harder job to find the killers. That's very true. Unless... You know, it's just occurred to me. Perhaps he killed himself. Uh, no, Prefect, no, forgive me. That's extremely improbable. Oh, I don't know. Anything's possible in this city. I dare say before very long, Jerusalem will be alive with rumors about it. That might be so. Yes. Now, the burial. The burial. Of the three criminals. Uh, yes. Now that also presented a problem. As I was preoccupied with this other business, I sent a detachment under my assistant, Tomai. Unfortunately, one of the bodies was missing. Missing? Don't alarm yourself, Prefect. They tracked it down in no time. It had been removed by a man called... Matthew the Levite. Yes, Hegemon. Every right to be. It 
practice the law. He was very agitated, begging and threatening in turn. He said that anyone had the right under the law to bury a prisoner who had been executed. He wouldn't leave the body. He said they'd have to kill him first. He even offered them a knife to do it. You can't tell the They'll have to kill me first. Go on. Did they get rid of him? No. Tom, I let him remain for the burial, and this calmed him down. Go on. Did he do wrong? Oh, no, 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 no. That was the right thing to do. Go on. Oh, there's little more to say. The three bodies were loaded onto the wagon and taken to a deserted gorge to the north of the city. The detachment dug a deep hole and buried them all together. Then they filled it in. Only Tolmai knows how it's marked. I wish I'd foreseen this. I'd have liked to meet this Matthew. He is here, Hegemon. Thank you. Thank you for all you've done in this affair. See that the burial detachment is rewarded. And tell Tolmai that I'm very pleased with him. Now I'd like to see Matthew. Very good. Lights! More lights! you sit on the chair. I'm dirty. I'll make a mess of it. Where's this knife of yours? The centurion took it off me. I'd like it back. It's not mine and I've got to return it. I stole it. Why? Centurion! Give me his knife. Who did you steal it from? From a baker shop at the Hebron Gate, on the left when you enter the city. Don't worry. It'll be returned. Now there's something else I want. Show me the goatskin parchment you carry to record the words of Yeshua Hanatsri. So you want it all. You want to take the last thing that I have. I didn't say give it to me. I said show it to me. See an educated man. There's no need for you to live like this in beggar's rags without a roof over your head. I'm a rich man. I'd like you to work for me. At my house in Caesarea, there's a large library. You could look after the books, index them. You'll be fed and clothed. No. I don't want that. Why? Do you hate me? No. If you would come to hate me, it can't be easy for you to look me in the face after what you did to him. That's enough!
Then let me give you something. I know you consider yourself to be his disciple, but you've learned nothing from what he taught you. If you had, you'd certainly accept something from me. He said before he died, he blamed no one. He would have taken something from me, I know. He was not a cruel man. You are. Where will you go then? There's someone that I'm going to kill. I want you to know that. I want you to know that there's going to be more bloodshed. I do know that. It doesn't surprise me in the least. You want to kill me, I suppose. I wouldn't be able to. And I'm not stupid enough to try, no. But if it takes me the rest of my life, I am going to kill Judas of Carioth. You won't succeed in doing that. He's already dead. He was murdered tonight. How? Oh. Who killed him? Don't be jealous. He had other admirers beside yourself. Who killed him? I did. It wasn't much, but I did it. Well, now, now will you accept something from me? Order them to give me a clean piece of parchment. Now we're together. We'll be together always. Where one of us goes, the other will follow. When people remember me, they will remember you in the same breath. Thus the fifth prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate, greeted the dawn of the 15th day of Nisan. Performances presents the cabinet of Dr. Ramirez, Peter Sellers' apocalyptic vision of life in the 90s. Starring Peter Gallagher, Joan Cusack, and Mikhail Baryshnikov. With music by John Adams. The Cabinet of Dr. Ramirez. Next.
great performances is made possible by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the annual financial support from viewers like you. And by Duracell, which proudly supports great performances, television's longest running performance series, Duracell. A copper top battery. This movie is goodbye to the 80s and a film for the 90s. Basically, the end of the yuppies, the end of the Wall Street superstructure, the spiritual recession, and directly into the heart of the current crisis, which hopefully is a useful one, a search for something that's actually valuable, an attempt to redefine America in non-materialistic terms. This is a silent movie uh, in color with wall-to-wall -wall music by John Adams and the Tibetan monks of Dramsala. The film is therefore hardly silent. It in fact, makes an enormous amount of noise, but people don't talk in it. Why is that? Well, for one thing, of course, uh, the great age of cinema acting, of the silent movies, the great D.W. Griffith, uh, the great Murnau, the great, well, the Gish sisters, and so on. That's a level of acting that one rarely sees because it comes from a kind of liberation of the soul of performers who are able to go deep, deep, deep within and we're very, very privileged in this film that you're about to see to have a great series of artists who offer something very profound. Of course, beyond that uh, is the fact that perhaps you could say my generation, uh, the generation of the 80s, was a silent generation. We didn't speak out certainly nowhere near enough. And I suppose the silence of this movie, of the characters in this movie, has to do with that. Also though, and perhaps more seriously, 80% of your life, at least, you're not talking. We don't talk all the time. Most of our lives we spend watching, listening, thinking, and feeling. And theater and movies that come from theater basically make you think that you talk all the time. But what actually are you doing most of your life? This is a movie about most of your life when you're not saying anything. The minute you start to talk, you, of course, always begin inventing things and, well, lying, <laughs> frankly. And this film is an attempt to get past the point of lying, both before it and after it to a point where you haven't yet convinced yourself what you think, much less attempted to convince anyone else. Those private moments, those personal moments of pure feeling. 